Airing first on Asheville FM, 103.3 WSFM LP in Asheville, North Carolina, this is The Final Straw Radio, a weekly anarchist and anti-authoritarian podcast and broadcast emanating from occupied Saligi land in southern Appalachia. We bring you voices from the long struggle towards liberation from around the world. Welcome. This week, Burst spoke with Benu Hannibal Rasun, co-founder of the Free Alabama Movement and the National Freedom Movement which is helping coordinate prisoner-led organizing across the so-called U.S. Bennu just finished a five-year period in segregated housing for his organizing efforts. For the hour, they talk about the national network coordination, the continuation of slavery from chattel slavery in which black and brown bodies were private property to the modern slavery of mass incarceration, the importance of platforming prisoners in their struggles, the January boycott FAM is conducting against prison industries, reform efforts, and more. You can learn more and get in touch with the Free Alabama Movement by visiting their websites, freealabamamovement.org and freealabamamovement.wordpress.com. Email them at freealabamamovement at gmail.com and find them on Fedbook and Twitter. You can reach the National Freedom Movement via one national freedom movement at gmail.com, and the one is the numeral one. The Final Straw is beginning to use our Patreon to fund comrades transcribing the episodes. Subscribers to our Patreon for $10 or more a month will receive an episode a month as a zine in the mail alongside other thank yous. For every $120 we raise in donations above $10, we will commit to another monthly episode transcribed up till our goal of $480 in those kind of donations. Transcriptions of our episodes allow for easier searching of content, so our chats will show up in search engines more quickly and completely. It'll also aid in translation, help folks for whom comprehension in English or audio is difficult, and make it easier for abolitionists to send our chats into prisoners for discussion. You can find out more at our Patreon. There's a link to that in our show notes. We'd also like to share a fundraiser being hosted by the Lixtamasu clan in so-called Canada for the purpose of expanding their sovereign village construction and to help pay for ongoing maintenance. You can find out more at their GoFundMe linked again in our show notes. For the audience, would you mind introducing yourself? My name is Ben Hannibal Rasan. I'm the founder of the Free Alabama Movement. Uh, I'm also the founder of an organization we're putting together now called the National Freedom Movement, where we're building a coalition of of, of inside-led, inside-based organizations, bringing all of those together. I also orchestrated the 2018 uh, campaign to redistribute the pain nationwide and also laid the groundwork for the 2016 uh, National Prison Strike, which was the largest strike uh, in U.S. history. And um, I'm incarcerated in the Alabama Department of Corrections. I've been incarcerated for uh, approaching 22 years now. And um, I'm an activist. I'm an organizer. I'm a freedom fighter. Uh, abolitionist says whatever um, is necessary in this fight behind these walls and cages. Thank you. And could you tell the audience a bit about the Free Alabama Movement, like how it came to be formed, your philosophy, and the methods that you use to struggle? Uh, who who participates in it? As I said, Free Alabama Movement was founded inside St. Clair Correctional Facility. Um, I ran across an article in 2012 that I did some research on, and it inspired me to come up with solutions to some of these issues we were facing here in the state of Alabama. And from that, we came with Free Alabama Movement. And um, it's a human rights movement. Started out, we were civil and human rights. We're moving more so away from the civil rights aspect and, and head on with the human rights aspect. Um, we acknowledge that these prisons are slave plantations and that they their roots trace back over 400 years to the institution of slavery. We are aware that ownership and control of these plantations occurred as a result of the 13th Amendment. So the ownership was transferred from private property owners to the state government. And what we know of and call prisons and mass incarceration today are nothing but cover up for what's actually going on. And it's a humanitarian crisis and it is slavery. Also, you asked about our methods. And so the methods that we use, um, because this is an economic enterprise, people call it the prison slavery industrialized complex. Um, 
so many different names, but at the core, it's, a, it's an economic system. And so we use economically based tactics, no different from what other laborers use um, in society. We organize the labor, we organize work strikes. And we also understand that there are a lot of, of contractors that are involved, such as, as, as phone companies, JPay, Access Security, and Incentive Package Programs, and whatnot. And so we organize boycotts of these companies. Also, there are a lot of industries. Uh, private industries uh, who are getting products and services from inside of prison. So we organize work strikes um, in those areas. And so basically everything that we're doing um, is a, is addressing the economic aspect of it. Because even with private prisons, uh, you see these companies listed on the on the stock exchange. Uh, people are investing in this stuff. People are, are buying and selling human bodies. Um, human trafficking, and the only way to drive those people away from the table is to drive, is to attack them uh, head on, point blank, at what brought them to the table, and it's the profit. And the profit is all centered on the labor um, and the funding that we spend from the inside, and so that's how we organize. We organize around that. Uh, we also use protests uh, to build awareness. Uh, to show support, we protest at the prisons. A lot of organizations and people like to march um, in the state capitals and whatnot. But we like to conduct our protests directly at the, the, the headquarters of, of these facilities. For example, the Department of Corrections. We like to protest there. The parole boards, we like to protest there. But most importantly, we like to protest at the prisons because that's where the people are. That's where the suffering is. That's where the crisis is. That's where the COVID-19 is killing people. That's where the drugs, um, the overdoses are occurring at. This is where the suicides are occurring at. This is where the murders and the police brutality is occurring at. And so this is where the presence has to be. This is where the inside presence is. And this is where the outside presence has to show up at to let us know that they support us. And we lead with our own ideas. We lead with our own initiatives. And we ask people to support us. So uh, that's how we structure um, our movement, and that's what the National Freedom Movement uh, that I mentioned earlier is all about. Um, it's about being inside-led, about being inside-based, and it's about people who are interested in this stuff coming to the table and not so much bringing their own plans and their own agendas, but to bring their resources and skills um, and apply them to the things that we're requesting because we don't have access to a lot of the things that people have in society as far as technology goes. We don't have the resources simply because of our condition. And so we ask people to come and, and to, like, maybe make flyers for us or make posters for us or set up phone apps or set up a... Um, um, one of the things that we're asking for from our outside support people is to... to to identify yourself in your state as a, a, a certified outside support organization. And what that means is that you'll set up a phone call, or set up a phone line to accept phone calls. And activists on the inside will share that information all around the state prison so that when activists are hijacked, we don't have to try to figure out who they're going to call, who they're going to contact. That designated outside support organization will be right there. The information will be inside the prison and people will know, contact them, uh, call them, and provide whatever resources. If we can get staff attorneys, if we can get paralegals, uh, people to assist with, um, you know, the administrative process. We're trying to set a structure up that is that is structured from the very beginning around what it takes to assist organizers on the inside. And and the reason why that's important because a lot of people bring stuff to the table that they think is a, is helpful. And a lot of that stuff is not helpful or it's paternalistic. They come and they want to tell us what to do. Well, we're tired of being told what to do. We're adults. We're thinkers. Uh, we're planners. We're strategists, tacticians, and all of that, too. We just don't have the resources. And so this is this is our response to that. This is how we're going to put our structure together on the inside. So if you have an inside organization and they want to be a part of this, then come on and get on board with the National Freedom Movement. Can you say how widespread the national freedom movement is? Like, I know that in the first time that you and I had a conversation years ago, there was representation in, in the chat also from Mississippi. I know that folks like um, uh, Imam Hassan in Ohio was a part of the Ohio movement. I've heard about it in Illinois. Where Where is representation right now? Or I don't know how much you can talk about with that for safety's sake. Okay, yes, I can talk about it. Uh, we want to we talk about it. We want people to know. 
Um, as you know, when we started out in 2014, we were just a stateside organization, but the support that we received, the attention we received uh, was from around the world. The majority of it was in the United States. And so when we received all that uh, support and we started building relationships with people, this is what allowed us to lay the groundwork for even creating uh, the thought about a, a national structure of bringing people together. So in 2015, I developed something called the Six Step, the Free Alabama Movement Six Step Plan of Action, and it laid out what organizers could do in their state to do the same thing that we were doing. Uh, still didn't know that it was going to turn into what it turned into, but it evolved. It got better. More people got involved, and the next thing you know, we had um, we were in, we were in connected with prisons all around the country, and that allowed us to have the the historic forty uh, fifth anniversary September ninth Attica Rebellion uh, national prison strike. And the thing about that was, even though we had that network and connections, it was not built as an organization. We just had very loose networks of people. And we had outside organizers. They brought their networks and their organizations, but they didn't help us build our own. And so when they left and things broke down, they took everything that they had with them. And they even took resources from them. They took, you know, our sacrifices, you know what I'm saying? They capitalized off of it. And so what I started doing in 2017, when I started writing out the campaign to redistribute the pain, which was a national bi-monthly boycott campaign, uh, throughout the entire year of 2018, in a November the 30th article that I wrote that was published by San Francisco Bayview, I started laying out what the framework of a national structure needed to be, what it should look like. And I put that in that article. And guys from the inside, uh, my brother Kwame Bean Shakir, um, he reached out. A few more people reached out. A few more organizations reached out. And, you know, they, they liked it, the idea of us doing that. And so... Um, I ended up getting sent to the shoe in Alabama, so that kind of uh, disrupted my ability to continue to do that because I was limited in what I could do, but I was able to do the the, um, the campaign to redistribute the pain. I was able to get the message that I just was not able to organize it the way I needed to. And so now that I finally got out of SIG after a little over five years, get my feet back on the ground, started back talking to people, now we're putting the actual infrastructure in place. Uh, we were in contact with Conrad Malik out in California. We were in, in contact with the United Black Family Scholarship Foundation, Ivan Kilgore. We were in contact with other activists and organizers on the inside from as far west California. Uh, we were in the Midwest. Uh, we have organizations of the Ohio, Indiana, um, activists in Michigan. We basically have the South, from South Carolina. We have South Carolina, Georgia, Florida. Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, and Texas. And these are all confirmed uh, people who have been consistently coming to our meetings. Uh, we're having people showing up from Pennsylvania now. Uh, we're getting calls out of New York. Um, we have our conference calls every uh, week. And people are just, they're coming on board, you know what I'm saying? But the main thing is that when we bring people on board, we're emphasizing to them that this is going to be an inside-based an inside-led organization, and we have a specific way that we want to structure it. We have specific issues that we want to address. And the reason why we're doing it like that is because some states have different issues. Every state doesn't have the same issue, but there are certain core issues that every state has, and the national structure will be responsible for directing the, the movement on these core issues that we all share in common. Um, but the thing that the glue that brings this all together is the method. Um, if you have a parole issue, if you have a post-conviction issue, if you have a sentencing issue, a habitual offender issue, mandatory minimum issue, we don't care what your issue is. Only thing we want to do is we want to bring all of the organizations together at the same time. Like you may see a protest in California. A couple of weeks later, you'll see one in Kansas. A couple of weeks later, you'll see one in Texas. Well, we want all of those protests to be going on at one time to elevate the issues nationwide. That's how we elevate the issues nationwide. We have to, to, to coordinate the actions nationwide. And we have four core principles or methods that we use. We use work strikes, boycotts, protests, and like I said, social media campaigns. We use social media. We have YouTube channels. We have Twitter. We have Instagram, Facebook. 
TikTok, we're building across all of these platforms because this is how people communicate. And so the National Freedom Movement will use these four methods to address whatever issues that our coalition members come to the table with. We have some issues that will be on a national scale, other issues that will be on a local scale. For example, this coming up April the 3rd, there was a call out of Georgia by an organizer. He's on Facebook by the name of uh, Peace Justice, One Million Men and Women Parole Rally. Well, when I saw that, I know that we have parole issues in Alabama, too. There's parole issues in Ohio, which is one of our main organizers, the Ensuring Parole for Incarcerated Citizens, the EPIC organization. They've been working uh, doing that. And so parole is an issue around the country. It's different, but the, 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 the fundamental issue is that the parole boards have discretion around the nation, and that's, they're using their discretion to keep these prisons full for, for, for economic interests. And so I said it is in our interest to support that but not not just support it in words, but to support it in action. And so this gave me the opportunity to actually bring this national freedom movement structure together around the issue. Because you don't want to just be calling people together to talking about, hey, we're trying to put a national freedom movement coalition together. 50,000 people to show up because there is no responsibility being placed on anyone. There is no duties. There's no obligation. Everybody likes to show up and talk. But when you have this issue sitting on the table, this parole issue, then I put it to the members, put it to the people we have been networking with. And like I said, the response has been great. People have been coming in, and we're letting them know that we're here. This We're here to build an organization, a coalition, not just to address parole, but to address all of our issues. It's just that this parole action right now gives us an opportunity to organize around, to, to bring people to the table, to, to, to address that component of this system right now as we continue to build a coalition to address a few more uh, wide-ranging issues. I know on our last call we had to have at least, you know, 12, 15 states on. I don't want to over-exaggerate, but it's recorded. People can go on there and look for themselves. We had multiple organizers inside and outside out of California, multiple organizers outside in the state of Texas, uh, multiple organizers inside and out, Mississippi, Alabama, our Florida representative and outside representative. We're trying to build up his support base on the inside. South Carolina was represented. They probably had the most people on the last call, the most people from the inside and the outside. We also had Ohio organizers on, on the call. So just so many people uh, were involved and more people are getting involved. People are coming that, you know, because it's an open platform. We're not trying to be exclusive. Uh, we don't have anything to hide. We're very transparent. We're building a media list um, to get this information out. We're trying to build a contact list to, to, to build awareness, and we're just trying to build this thing. But the thing is we want it to be led from the inside, and we have some particular duties and responsibilities that we need outside organizations to carry out, and we orientate them to that, and we allow them the opportunity to answer do they want to do that? And a lot of them are answered the call and they're here for us. Because I was looking to ask about some specific Alabama questions, but since you're talking about the national framework and involvement inside and outside, I'll just ask this last question first. How do people in their various states, whether they're behind bars or on the outside of bars, whatever that means, like how do folks get in contact with the National Freedom Movement or with Free Alabama Movement or figure out if there are already people doing stuff in their state or how they can get involved and how do they become a part of those conversations? Okay, the number one, nationalfreedommovement at gmail.com. That is our email address. We're in the process of getting our website put together. That, that additional resource will be there. It'll be available. I think it may already be available. It's just not all of our information is there. But that is uh, freealabamamovement.org, www.freealabamamovement.org. The contact information for Free Alabama Movement right now is freealabamamovement at gmail.com. What people have to understand is that we have very limited access to that technology. And with limited access to technology, we have limited knowledge about technology and what all we can use. And so right now we have a limited means for people to contact us. They can contact Free Alabama Movement on basically any platform. But as far as the national freedom movement, it's something we're just putting together. We're getting people to come to the table. We're having a Zoom call every Saturday 
We have an organization, Be Frank for Justice. They're, they've come and volunteered to sponsor our Zoom call. So they come on, they conduct our Zoom calls, they share our documents, they put our um, organizing agenda on there, our plans. Uh, like I said, we've got a couple of uh, Google Sheets put together. We're building all of that. We're just now in the early phases of, of actually building this infrastructure, but we've had a lot of people to come, and we're receiving a lot of support, and we're, we're more than pleased with where we are and what we've been able to accomplish thus far. But we need more people. But like I said, when you come, you need to understand what you're coming for. This is not for you to come and tell people what to do. This is not for you to come and, and, and you think it should be this, this, this. This is for you to come and offer suggestions, ideas. But the final decision on whatever's going to be done in your state is going to be made by someone on the inside as far as the National Freedom Movement goes. And whether or not your organization can be recognized as an official outside support organization will be determined by people on the inside, you know. And so that's the thing that's new, I think, that people are going to have to get used to uh, and prepare themselves for because a lot of people, whether they know it or not, consciously or subconsciously, they don't give people on the inside credit for our ability to think either. You know, when they come to the table, they think, you know, well, we'll do this, and this is what y'all need to do, or this is what we'll do. But the outside ideas have not advanced the call. It has been the inside ideas. It has been the inside work strikes, the inside boycotts, the inside um, protesting demonstrations. It has been the inside filming from phones and taking risks and absorbing the punishment that comes with it that has pushed this movement forward. And we feel like that there can be no legitimate movement that does not include people on the inside. And that means in all areas. We have to be at the table in all areas. And when we have issues with that or we have problems that no problem. We'll create our own table, and we're going to drive this movement. We're going to be a part of it. This concept of people talking about we are their voices or we're the voice for the voices, all of that is, is very disrespectful. We have a voice. We have a voice. What we don't have is people like you, Birth, and others who are willing to extend their platforms to our voice. Instead, they want to go in there and do the talking for us, call, ask a few questions, and then come and put their spin or their narrative on it. Well, we're not going for that. We're going to build our own network. We're going to build our own media. We're going to be uh, aligning ourselves with people like Burst and others who, who understand the importance and value of our voices being heard in this, and that's how we're going to build our network. We don't care that the mainstream media doesn't do this and that and the other. No problem. We can create a we can we can be just as powerful as the mainstream media if we organize and that's what we're doing. We're organizing that also as a component of this national freedom movement structure. So we're not dependent on anyone doing it for us. We got YouTube channels, we can publish, we have Zoom, we can do all of that. Uh the the, the, the live yard, we can do the stream yard, whatever it is, we just need people to bring those resources to us, let us know what's available. We'll let you know what we want to use, and we'll let you know how we want to get it out there. And then you just extend that to us, and that's how we want to build this national freedom movement. Can you talk about the current protests and boycott that Free Alabama Movement is conducting? Right. Um, the boycott is a continuation of the campaign to redistribute the pain and what we've been doing overall as a whole um, as an organization um, since 2017. Anyone who wants to learn about the campaign to redistribute the pain Go on the San Francisco Bayview website, put in my name, Benu Hannibal Rasan, that's B-E-N-N-U, Hannibal, H-A-N-N-I-B-A-L, Rasan, R-A-S-U-N, put in campaign to redistribute the pain, and you'll see all those articles. And like I said, there are two, there are two sides to this economic. The, the, the first foremost is the labor. And after the labor is these contractors, these phone companies, these, these incentive packages, these people that sell all of the stuff, the, the canteen goods and stuff. So all of, both of these together is where these operating budgets come from. This is where the profits come from. And so this, this, this campaign right now, this 30-day economic boycott um, that was called for by Kinetic Justice Amon, uh, that's what's going on now. But more so than that, people need to understand this is a call to action. It is not to say that everything, that everyone has to be involved on the first day. You may join as you learn about it, as you get more information. You may want to join some point later on during these 30 days. You may want to do something different, but you have to 
attack this stuff at the core. And that's how we're, this is, these are the only actions that we feel like that can make an impact for those of us on the inside. And so when you see us make a call like this, remember, we can contact our family members. They can contact legislators. They can go and get bills passed. They can go and get phones out. But while we are, we can be a part of that. But what can we do in addition on the inside? Because the issue boils down to are you doing everything that you can to get free? And the answer to that question includes, are you working for free? Are you providing free slave labor? Are you providing resources to the state to pay for your incarceration? And if you're not addressing all of those, then the answer to that question of are you doing everything, the question is no, because you may be filing all of your petitions and stuff. And that's great. But that's not the only thing that we can do. And so we, we've broken this thing down and figured out what can we do on the inside so that when our people go and talk to legislators, they go and negotiate from a strength of power and not from a strength of weakness. And the power that we have to empower our people with is this labor because the prison legal news did an article, I think it was in 2016, and it showed the institutional investors in these private prisons. The top, the top 10 institutional investors includes um, an uh, employees' retirement system mutual fund here in the state of Alabama. And that system is made up the judges' retirement system, the, the state employees' retirement system, and the teachers' retirement system. So these are people who all have an economic interest in this system. These people literally finance their retirement systems off of these prisons. And we've also got a list of the contractors around the state, state agencies that are going in contracting out, convict leasing, hiring slaves out from the prison system to come and do a lot of labor, and they're getting paid market value for it, but the people performing the labor are getting either nothing or $2 a day or whatever it is that they're putting out. And so the only way that we can attack all of that is we've got to stop that labor. We've got to stop that money stream, that money flow um, coming in, and, and, and this is how we're doing it, you know what I'm saying? And this is what our role is in this movement. This is our role. It's not writing articles and not that. That's part of our role. But everything that we do has to be centered around the economics because when you remove the economics from the system, you destroy about 80% of it. When people talk about wrongful convictions, over sentencing, mandatory minimums, drug laws, and enhancers, all of that is, those are, those are, those are monetary. Those are like rules or laws for people to make sure that their, their, their investments and profits are more long-term and not short-term. And so when you attack the labor, what makes those laws profitable, then you start clearing out the system because they cannot afford to keep these systems running if they're not making money off of them. And so that's what we're doing. We're trying to cut. We're trying to cut off the money. We're trying to defund from the inside through direct action until the legislators and others and the investors figure out that they're not going to be making money off of this stuff forever. We're going to stop that, and this is how we do that part. And when we do that, when our people go and talk to, to people, whoever they need to talk to, they sit down at the table with them, and they're not sitting there just begging. It's not a one-sided conversation. The person that's sitting across from them, that state employee, their retirement is in control, is being controlled by that person, our family members that's sitting on the other side of that table. So everyone has an interest in those conversations, and this is how we're trying to empower our people um, to increase their standing when, they, when they're sitting at the table negotiating. I guess to bring it back, like, and not to say that the federal government does right, but sometimes it investigates and it's forced to investigate in situations where it's pressured to. The ADOC, the Alabama Department of Corrections, as well as like Louisiana and a bunch of other states have been under pressure from the federal government for a number of years due to findings of overcrowding, due to uh, terrible sanitation issues, brutality within the prisons not being re- like regulated or, you know, just for all of these issues, the fact that they're, fa- they're failing in the quote unquote corrections element of what they're proposing that they're providing. And so because of this, the ADOC was supposed to be releasing, they decided to release thousands of prisoners starting in October of this year. And yet the Southern Poverty Law Center reported in July of this year 
that hundreds of people were being denied parole amongst the like while the pandemic is going on and that in this white prisoners were at least twice as likely to be paroled as black prisoners in september governor k ivy and the adoc announced that they were going to be building three more prisons um, partnering with private prison industries including core civic and a conglomerate called alabama prison transformation partners where do you see alabama on the promise to decrease the prison population and and their motivations right well first thing first thing we we have to remember is that the state of alabama has been a slaveholder state since it's been in existence and so even though they're using the words new prisons they know they're building new plantations as far as the federal government, the federal government has been involved with Alabama prisons since 1865 when the 13th Amendment was ratified and it said that neither slavery nor involuntary servitude except as punishment for crime shall exist. With that, that made the criminal justice system the place where you convicted for crime and the slavery and involuntary servitude aspect was carried out in the institutions that were created by the 13th Amendment, which were the prisons. Now, when you talk about the conditions and whatnot, then you're talking about the actual practice of slavery. In order for the institution of slavery to go on, you can't house people in in five-star hotels and and split-level mansions and stuff. You have the most deplorable and inhumane conditions because this is the least amount of investment. So everything that we're seeing here um, is consistent with the historical practice of the institution of slavery. Um, also, on the federal government side, the federal government, the, 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 the Constitution of the United States is the federal constitution. So the federal government has been involved with Alabama prisons since their existence, and not once have they stopped the institution of slavery or the slave practices that go on. They, they, they've always found these prisons to be in violation of the Eighth Amendment. In the 1870s, they found it as such the solution. They made Alabama build more prisons. In the 1920s and 30s, they found these prisons to be below a human standard. They made Alabama build new prisons. In the 1970s, the, the, the federal government found these slave-like conditions, plantation slave-like conditions in the federal court. They, they took the prison system over, put it in receivership, made Alabama build new prisons. Every time the federal government gets involved, even the result from that aspect is the same. Alabama ends up building new prisons. Everything's hunky dory. No problem solved. Now, these, these most recent reports uh, have garnered more attention simply because of the era and the time that we're living in and the magnitude of the microscope that's on the Alabama prison system. The reason why people are familiar with Alabama prisons is because of the sacrifices we made with Free Alabama Movement beginning in 2014. Prior to that, you very rarely heard anything about the Alabama prison system. Since that time, the Alabama prison system has been the most talked about, has been in the news more than any other prison system in the country. And that's because we expose the conditions, the lies, and everything uh, through, through, our, through our methods. And, and so being a black person in America, the federal government left us doing um, reconstruction. The federal government left us during the civil rights era. The federal government um, has been responsible for the assassinate, assassination of our leaders through the Cointel Pro, um, the, the Black Power Movement, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, uh, Fred Hampton Jr. Um, and just recently, the federal government is declining to prosecute these um, slave catchers, these police officers. They're not, they just recently announced that they're not going to do anything about the Tamir Rice assassination. So the federal government has never shown itself to be a friend of the African-American people, the brown people, the, the, the poor class of white people. The federal, federal government is not a friend in this situation. The federal government is, is, is part of parcel working hand in hand with the state government to create a solution that will become acceptable to the people but it's not going to be to solve the problem. So we don't see anything. I mean, you think about it. In, in, in 2014, the federal government came out with a report and said that the women at Tutwiler were being sexually abused for over 20 years. They didn't arrest anyone. No one lost their jobs. No one was held accountable. You know what I'm saying? Um, we just saw another report in another state prison system. The federal government just came out with another one of those reports. They came out with two or three reports in the state of Alabama. 
murders, uh, cover-ups, uh, abusive process, uh, violating the oath. No one is being arrested and held accountable. So there's nothing about the federal government that we stand here and say our Savior has arrived. That's the reason why we're continuing on with our organizing. we got to save ourselves. If, if you're a black person and you don't know about COINTELPRO and you don't know about these things that the federal government has done, if you don't know about the experiments, the genocidal experiments that the federal government has done, if you don't know about reconstruction and how the federal government left us to be assassinated and slaughtered, by the KKK, if you don't know how um, J. Edgar Hoover used the federal government tax dollar to carry out a domestic war against um, black people rising up uh, from this oppression, then you need to do yourself a favor and do research. But you don't have to go back to the 70s. You can look at the actions of the federal government since these police murders, um, and look at the federal government. They're free of the system. These laws that Joe Biden and them these are federal laws. These are federal laws. So the federal government is doing the same thing. You know what I'm saying? So these are not. These are not. They're not here to save the day. Unfortunately, they're here to save America and the perception of America that's being put out there uh, as a result of the actions that are, that we're taking on the inside. The Final Star Radio is a proud member of the Channel Zero Network of Anarchist Podcasts, and here's a jingle from another member of CZN. How can we imagine a world beyond prisons and police, borders and surveillance? Rust Belt Abolition Radio is an abolitionist media and movement building project based in Detroit, Michigan. Each monthly episode amplifies the voices of those impacted by mass incarceration and explores ongoing work in the movement to abolish the carceral state and racial capitalism. Tune in to Rust Belt Abolition Radio here on the Channel Zero Network and visit www.rustbeltradio.org to learn more. I'm wondering what kind of response do you and well, I don't know you can't necessarily speak for other people and I don't know if FAM has put out like a statement or the national movement, but what sort of response do you have to the proposal by Democrats in the House of uh, like a sort of abolition amendment to the Constitution that was proposed in early December by uh, Senator Jeff Merkley and Representative William Lacey Clay of Missouri to that would basically take the loophole loophole take the punishment clause out of the 13th amendment's language and fully abolish slavery do you think that there's do you have an, are you kind of hopeful about that do you think there's a possibility or it, it's a great start it's a great conversation piece it's an important piece but remember they're only talking about changing the language but as i pointed out a few minutes ago when the 13th amendment was ratified it wasn't just language that was added onto the book when the language was added, institutions were built. Departments of Corrections came into existence as a result of this language. And then there are practices that were put in place. The convict leasing system of the, of the uh, 19th and early 20th century came into existence because of this law. Um, the, the, the stuff that we see with these district attorneys and the, the, the judges and the anti-terrorism effective death penalty act, prison litigation reform act, um, the mandatory all of these laws were put in place because of what they were doing as a result of the 13th Amendment. So simply changing the language of the 13th Amendment is one thing. What about the institutions that were built because of it? They're not talking about taking these institutions down, which are the prisons, and the practices. Okay, the fact that the language is removed how does that translate immediately? We saw the language change in Colorado. We saw a change in Utah. We saw a change in Nebraska. But what has changed about the practice and what has been the change as far as the institutions? We haven't saw any. We see the guys in Colorado have filed lawsuits now, which is great. We have to get behind that. But it's more than just changing language because the language had a, had a practical effect on this country. It, it, it caused the prison system that we know today to be built, and it caused a certain type of practice where it's, the labor was being exploited, and these people created a monopoly over every dime that we get. They control it 100%. And so all of that has to change with it. And that's the thing that we're emphasizing in the movement. It's great to see the language, but the language is only a start. It is not the end game, and we're not going to be fooled or deceived by it. 
So switching gears slightly, let's talk about the looming pandemic that all of us are experiencing. How have you experienced the pandemic in the Alabama prison system at at your facility in particular? Did the ADOC release prisoners with upcoming release dates or health concerns such as old age or pre-existing conditions who might be especially endangered by the pandemic? I know that was a claim and a like a not only the like elements of the federal government brought lawsuits against BOP facilities for that, but I know state by state, certain states made the claim that they would do this thing in order to respect the dignity and the possibility of human life of, of people that they were putting in cages. Well, you don't go from a slave owner to a humanitarian and lover of human beings overnight. This pandemic in and of itself it gave them an opportunity to be confronted with the issues that they had created as a result of what we call, you know, mass incarcerating, over incarcerating and all of that stuff. And they did not address that. The fact that they may release a few people is good PR, but it's not, it's not good for human life. So whatever they're claiming, how many people they claim we haven't saw any of that yet. Like I said, the slave, the, the, the southern states did not free their slaves. They went to war, and when the war was over with, the only thing they agreed to was to transfer ownership over, over to the government or to nationalize it, as we say. But um, today, these promises about releasing people, and it has not been a reality. You know, if you go back and look at that, that, that conversation about the um, early release, there was a law on the books in Alabama that called for um, mandatory parole release of people who were sentenced since 2016. They had not been complying that. There was no paperwork explaining it. No one knew how it was implemented. You just had a bunch of people talking about it. And so we started talking about it because I met a guy named Frog at Limestone. He brought it to my attention. And when I got to this institution I met, I started researching it and I found out that this is a law that entitled people to go free that the state of Alabama is not complying with. And so we started talking about it. And I started doing a blog on it, started doing little radio shows talking about it. And then when the pandemic hit, we did a press statement and we mentioned it again. And that was the first time that, that we received a response from the state. And then they said it's supposed to be done through Citra Records and they came with a process for it. So that wasn't a result of the pandemic. That was a result of activism from us on the inside. To our knowledge, they have not taken any action to save any lives on the inside. And we're seeing people in their 60s, 70s, and 80s die every day inside these prisons who should be released and should be home. Now, I don't want this question to to make it sound like I have any love for guards, but it seems like state by state, at least with folks that I've talked to in Ohio um, in particular more recently, that, uh, and I know that this has been the case in the past in Alabama where there's been like just broiling conflict between the workers in these facilities and the administrations that are wanting to cut back on staffing, cut back on, you know, health concerns, cut back on things that would increase the safety for guards when they're in there doing whatever job they're doing. And I would imagine that it's been a similar situation for the staff of the prisons during this pandemic that, they've also been thrown under the bus by the administration because it's still about money and they're just cogs in the machine. Is that an okay way of looking at it? And has that grabbed any traction? Yeah, I mean, these people are, they're human beings. They got jobs, they got families. They're not trying to take COVID home and kill anybody in their family. But the fact that it matters is in order for them to make a living and to afford the lifestyle that they've been able to afford, with the skill set that they have. Because these, you know, they don't recruit correctional officers from, from Harvard or Yale or, or, or Howard or, or Clark Atlanta or Morehouse. They don't recruit them from there. They recruit these people from the outer margins of society with, you know, limited education. And these people come in here and they're told that, you know, if you want your credit clean up, you want to be able to afford to get your hair done, you want to get your house and car, this job will provide a middle-class lifestyle for you with a GED. That's the only thing that's required with a GED. And so they take the job. And with benefits, paid holidays, and off time, and you know, everything. And then when they get inside, they don't really have to do a lot of work. So 
from their perspective, this is a good financial offer for them. And so we understand what brings them here. And then for the black officers, you know, there's only a limited amount of jobs already available to black people. And there's very few of them that is going to allow them to have the, the lifestyle that they have with the, the education and social economic background that they come from. So we we not oblivious to all of that. Be that as it may, when they come inside these places, they know what's wrong. They see what's wrong. And they're not sophisticated enough to even understand the danger to themselves. You know, no one will be walking around. If, 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 if anyone, reasonable, sensible person, will not be coming up in here like this, you know, but... It is what it is. I mean, we're here. They're here. We're all in this shit together to a degree. You know, we're not on the same side of the fence. But, hell, if COVID comes, they bringing this shit in. We're getting it. And if the state ain't checking us or checking them, then we just transferring it back and forward to each other. So, I mean, it's just, it's overwhelming. It really is. It's overwhelming to see that people, you know, and, and we have to have that conversation. We have to educate them in life. But all of us are stuck in this damn fishbowl, and the people who are making the shots, calling the shots and making the decisions, they're in the, the, the downtown Montgomery's, or they're in the state capitals, or they're in Washington, D.C. They're insulated and far removed from this shit, and they have enough money saved up. They're wealthy enough that they can take the time off. They can secure themselves. And so, you know, this pandemic the way that it's being managed, the lack of investment, the lack of legitimate resources, PPEs and whatnot, the lack of bleach, the lack of cleaning supplies, the overcrowding, the inability to social distance, it's just a, it's a slaughter. You know, it's a human slaughter. It's a humanitarian crisis. It's very underreported. It's underappreciated. People don't really understand what we're up against here, how many people are dying, how many people are sick. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure I had contracted COVID seeing it in real time. And people talking about the pandemic, like before the, the COVID-19 pandemic, there was already a, several epidemics. Alabama prisons became the most violent prisons in the nation. The murder rate leads the nation. The suicide rate is one of the leading in the nation. The drug overdose rate, one of the leading in the nation. Um, You know, the malnutrition over a long period of time what that does to the body, causing people to die early. You know what I'm saying? Our mortality rate is like seven or eight years younger than the average person in society just from being in prison. Some people die a lot sooner because of the inadequate health care. We see mental health people who don't even have the faculty to protect themselves from COVID or anyone else. And the drugs, see, people are overlooking the drugs in this epidemic. When you have a drug addiction, with these drugs that they have today, this this flock and this ice and these, these non altering drugs. When you have that and you have people when they wake up in the morning and they done sold everything they got, they done sold their bodies, uh, they're prostituting themselves out, they're doing they're they're willing to do anything for a high. These people don't have masks. If they get a brand new mask, they gonna sell it because they're gonna sell it to, to, to get high. And so now you have this going on in the midst of a pandemic that's going to continue to keep the, the pandemic in circulation. And the drugs, the drugs in and of themselves is already killing people. So we had a, a drug pandemic going on. We had a, a, a violence issue pandemic going on. We have a suicide issue um, epidemic going on. And then you're going to add a pandemic on top of that with a virus that for what we got going on inside the prison, um, the way that we're forced to live, the culture that we're forced to live in, it, I mean, there's nothing else that could, you're either going to, only two things can be done. You can release us and take us out of this hell, or you can stand back and watch us die. And they chose the latter verse. They stand back watching us die. On the day after Christmas, there was an uprising at McCormick CI in South Carolina that led to some attempted escapes and the taking and eventual release of unharmed guards by the prisoners. It's a different state. You did mention that South Carolina folks are organizing in this. And um, I was wondering if you had any comments about what you heard about the circumstances of people incarcerated at McCormick, the deprivation caused by the prison crats. Like that's a facility that I know, like in the lead up to 2018, there had been a situation where 
the windows yeah. had been bolted over with steel plates denying sunlight to people on the inside people were in a lockback situation uh i believe south carolina like a lot of other states particularly around um the u.s south the former slave holding states although not limited to that had have to like experience gladiator fights that are coordinated by the the guards that are standing over them who who bet money on who's going to survive them i wonder if you can talk about what you've heard about mccormick well, we haven't really got a lot as far as the details go. Uh, we know that those guys are being subject to relentless cell searches, security searches. They're trying to get the phones out because they don't want those guys to get the story out. That's the emphasis that the state has. But when you see something like that, you know, you're you're witnessing human survival. These guys are doing what they have to do to survive. You can call it an escape all you want to. But the fact is, if you're in an environment where you're threatened with death and the people who have a responsibility to protect you are the ones who are also threatened, then you got to do something to get out. You know what I'm saying? And the fact that they chose that route means that they didn't see any other way to survive. Because, you know, however we frame it or talk about it, our survival is at stake. And we're not going to survive the COVID-19 unless something groundbreaking and monumental occurs. Over a million people are going to have to be released from these prisons. Um, a lot of these prisons are going to have to be closed down. If that doesn't happen, a lot of people are going to die. And whatever anyone does to escape that death, you know, I'm all for it. You know what I'm saying? I understand it. I know it when I see it. And those guys are trying to escape death. You know what I'm saying? They're not trying to escape prison. They're trying to escape death. And uh, that was what they did, um, you know, allegedly. And so if that be the case, you know what I'm saying, we can't blame them. And we support them, you know what I'm saying. Not only we not blame them, we don't criticize them, we don't have anything negative to say about what they've done. We support them because everyone has the right to live. And the state is taking that away inside these prisons. We, they're, they're saying that we don't even have a right to live. They can create an environment where we can be, our lives can be in jeopardy. And it's okay. You know what I'm saying? They've got to release they they've got to they've got to alleviate the crowding in these prisons. And if they don't want to do it for us, then we have to take action to do it for ourselves. I'd be interested in your experience of the uprisings of this year in response to the ongoing killing of black, brown and poor people by police sparked by the broadcast of the murder of George Floyd and by the Minneapolis police and the resulting swell in calls for defunding and abolition of policing, uh, as well as of prisons. The abolitionist movement in the U.S. recognizes, most of it recognizes police and, and prisons as an anti-black settler state, like in the in that situation as being two arms of the same beast. That's very important. Like I wrote about that in my book and, and what that means to people because we always want people to understand that these people who are being murdered by the police over 95, 98 percent of them, the police are there to bring them to a prison. Breonna Taylor, they was drugs. They was trying to take somebody to prison. Yeah. Um, George Floyd, um, they was trying to take him to prison. Sandra Bland, they were trying to take her to prison. Mike Brown, they were trying to take him to prison. And if you survive the bullet in the street, then you get in, you get inside these prisons and you ain't surviving that. You know what I'm saying? But all of it's interconnected. It's all part of the same system. That's the reason why the police are involved. Everyone in prison, the police were involved. See, people have to remember, it's a lot of people in prison who survived those gunshots. And they survived them at a time and in a climate where you couldn't get the charges dropped, like Breonna Taylor's um, boyfriend. A lot of these guys had to carry those charges on through. Think about the charges that Mike Brown would have been facing had he survived. Resisting arrest. Uh, assault on an officer, aggravated assault, Petty uh, theft. whatever the store clerk would have been calling. He would have had all those charges. He would have had an outrageous bond. So there's the bail bonding issue. He would end up having to plead guilty. There's the plea guilty. It's the plea issue again. And then he would have been sentenced as a violent offender. There's the violent label again. He wouldn't have been made parole. There's that issue again. All of it's interconnected. All of it's interconnected. And some of it, some people's, in came on the street, 
Some people's in are going to be inside of a prison as a result of the rest of the drag net that they got set up. So it's all connected, man. Seeing people rise up like that, you know, we see so many things on the news. We hear so many things. We don't really know what's going on. People, I mean, I, I can't, I can speak for myself. I'm not going to try to continue. I don't know what was going on. I saw all the people out there. I saw them worldwide. I saw them demand and stuff, but the, the, the type of changes that I wanted to do, I didn't hear them. You know, so I didn't hear the, the call for reparations. I heard people saying, well, you know, a lot of white people integrating into it. There's a lot of anarchists. And I, you know, I don't know what all this stuff looks like. You know what I'm saying? I just hear these names, and then we see police stations and probation and parole officers being burnt up. So I don't know who these I don't know what inspires them to do. So I really don't know what I'm seeing because we hear so many different things. Like they say that these people will come when these situations occur and be behind the scenes hijacking. It. You know, and all we got is the world news and the internet. You know, we don't really know what what all of that was all about, what caused all of that. What we do know is that the manner that George Floyd was killed was gut wrenching for people. People can sit there in hindsight, and understand just how brutal and barbaric that was. And I think that that's one of the things. Um, I don't know if that's the main thing, you know, human psychology, the way that we all connect it. I don't know. But I imagine that just sitting there and watching this man have the life sucked out of him live by a callous, unconcerned police officer who's doing everything by the book. You know, everything that they were doing was by the book. And this tells you what the book looks like, you know. And uh, that same training from the book that they got is the same training that these officers got um, in these in these prisons. So, I mean, it's just we connected on a lot of levels, but like I said, we connected with the experience that George Floyd went through. Now, I can't speak for other guys' experience. I don't know what they were involved in, but I was not conscious uh, before I got incarcerated. So I was not out and hadn't been to no protest. I was locked up when the media man movement occurred and so I had not been a part of any of this stuff so I'm still an observer I'm still learning you know but I can just speak to my experiences as a as a, uh, as a black person and uh identify with what what uh what happened to George Floyd on that day and I know that there are numerous times when they could have killed me you know so but it was good to see that people cared about that all around the world that people were paying attention to that all around the world. I don't know what the narratives were or none of that stuff, but uh, just the fact that that many people paid attention to the the murder of another black man. That was good, but on the flip side, on the inside, you know, these are moments that we are constantly allowing ourselves to be left out of. That's why I'm talking about uh, building this national coalition led from the inside so we can be connected. So when things like this happen, we can we can we can we can get involved. You know what I'm saying? We can get involved in a lot of this stuff. When people go out into the street march and protest if we get connected, um and build a proper coalition. The second part of your question about defunding the police and all of that and all of this stuff is being connected. The abolitionist movement, you know, again you know, this is stuff that we didn't snip it, snip it of. So we want to defund the prison. We want to defund the parole board. We want to defund all of this stuff. You know, we got some stuff we want to defund, too. You know, so, uh, I mean, but the thing is, everybody needs to be working together. Everyone who sees and understands that all of these systems are interconnected, we all need to be working together. Uh, the hunger strikers, I saw a report that one of the hunger strikers in Alabama uh, was retaliated against, was jumped on by police. And, you know, it's still, it's, it's something going on in Alabama, but the things that he just suffered, that, that beating folks, are going on all around the United States. So why aren't we all on conference calls, or why aren't we all in, in some type of regional calls talking about this and the other things that are going on with the um, ICE detention facility in New Jersey, the, the fires being set throughout um, the Texas prison system. You know, why aren't we on the phone talking about these things and trying to figure out what is it that we all need to be doing collectively instead of state by state, you know what I'm saying, sporadic by sporadic. We got to turn up a whole lot more 
in order for our problems to, to go away. So that's the that's the focus for me, man. The defund things are great, you know, and the people are talking about in society, but I'm more concerned with what guys on the inside are talking about. We need to make sure that our voices are being heard. The issues that we have, uh, we're, verbal, we're vocalizing those and that we have a, a, a plan of action uh, with methods and tactics that strategies that we can use from the inside. And that's what's up with us, uh, you know, as far as this. Well, Benu, is there anything that I didn't ask you about that you wanted to address um, on this episode? Um, I can't think of anything. Uh, just, to, just wanted. I know we have we have personal conversations, and then we have these conversations. Just make sure that the personal conversations are separated out from this. Absolutely. And I guess you can uh, delete them or whatever you do with them. I just want to make sure that that's done like that. And um, other than that, um, no, I don't. What about you? What is there anything else you want to ask? Are there other things going on um, that we you think I might be I need to know about? You know. Uh, nobody ever asked me questions when I'm <laughs> on the microphone talking to them. <laughs> this is an awkward position to be in. Um, <laughs> hold on one second, will you? Okay. All right. <laughs> so I haven't, I haven't asked anyone about this specifically and we haven't said a thing on, on our show about it, but anti-prison activists, activists for liberation, abolitionists, on the inside especially are always in danger of dying or do die and they don't necessarily get a lot of recognition from the outside i want to like go into this question recognizing that but okay. there were a couple of activists in florida recently uh who passed um karen smith and rebecca hensley there were yeah. outside activists who had a lot of connections to a lot of folks um behind bars and were known in their communities um for not just advocating but also like amplifying the voices of folks on the inside and i wonder if if you want to say anything about either of them if you had a relationship with them or since this a year did pass if you want to name anyone okay well well always you know we like to uplift um uh, richard mcfundy late he uh, joined the ancestors also and um he's the one that taught most of us taught us consciousness taught us you know, he taught us struggle. He taught us revolution, you know. He revolutionized our minds. He broke us away from the stuff that was destroying the community and taught us how to feel. I knew of Karen. I didn't. I, I don't think I've had a personal relationship with her. You know, I received so many mails and stuff. I don't know if I ever received mail or anything from her. But Rebecca, I do know Rebecca. We talked uh, several times. Uh, she sent me the book, uh, Alfred Woodfox's book. And uh, I got it right here with me now. So uh, we talked. We communicated, you know what I'm saying, with some of the, she, she told me a lot about what she was doing in Louisiana uh, with the guys in the Louisiana prison system and stuff. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, but we, we've got to replace them. You know, we, we've, um, this is a long-term struggle. This is a long-term struggle. And these are great people that came in and did great things. And now so other people have to step up and replace those people and, you know what I'm saying, learn from the examples that they led by, uh, learn from their writings, learn from the relationships that they built, and then apply that and keep moving, keep keep pushing the movement forward. You know, so other people have to step up. Now it's an opportunity for others to step up and fill these gaps uh, that have been left by these people who have passed on, but that's, that's part of the struggle too. You know, we have to be re resilient. Uh, we have to be resourceful. Uh, we have to, to listen to what our elders taught us and pay attention to history. And then we have to apply that to our next move. Like they say in the game, you want your next move to be your best move. Well, when you rely on the experiences of people like that and what they left behind, in addition to what's going on today, then you put yourself in better position. So, yeah, we salute to them, man. Appreciate everything they've done. Like I said, um, I didn't know Karen well, but, you know, I did know Rebecca, and I know that she was a... Uh, Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Benny, for this conversation. And um, I'll make sure to plug in all the information so folks can can get in touch with you. And I hope this helps the struggle and helps to, to build that network. Stay healthy. Okay, I appreciate it. And now for some words from anarchist prisoner Sean Swain. What you say?
following is a continuation of information compiled by the website killedbypolice.net. Here are the names starting on March 1st, 2020. Joshua Russell, Raimundo Erinseja, an unidentified person, an unidentified person, Ian Austin Wilson, Cody Hodges, Terry Cagle, Jose Antonio Gainza, Ryan Bass, Christopher Palmer, Gary Lee Tierney, Jean Beasley, AJ Camille Isley, Elijah Jamal Brewer, Jacob Frausto, Tyler M. Jones, Barry Gadus, Jerry Goggins, Kenneth Mullins, Matthew Adam Miller, Gary Brown, Charles Harwood, Lawson Edward Skaber, Desiree Nicole Graza, Brian Merksberry, Keith P. Howe, Aaron Tolan, Jennifer Taylor, Jesus Bonito Garcia, Pablo Elias, Joshua Christopher Knowles, Mary Kate Field, Brianna Taylor, Duncan Socrates Limp, Donnie Sanders, Jorge Martinez, Mark Morgan, Rosario Angel Alvarado, Dung Nguyen, Christopher Mullins, an unidentified person, Jeremiah Medina, Justin Griggs, Chase Brooks, Rory Edwin Murray, Jesse Cardillo, Michael Brandon Potter, Catherine Gomez, Douglas J. Foster, Darwin Foy, Juanita Ovei, an unidentified person, Dakota Wayne Yancey, Marvin O'Reilly, Charity Thorne, William Simpkins, Harold Spencer, Stephen Allier, LeBaron Ballard, Kyle Anthony Eichler, Charles Parker, Larry Mulraney, Mikhail Johnson, Kamal Kobe Edwards, Alvin Lamont Baum, Israel Lucas, Brian Penna, Gerald Johnson, Carlos Delgado, Charles Edward Marsh, Michael Wallace, Catherine R. Hale, Christopher Joel Mock, Mariko Hernandez, Matthew Moore, Glenn A. White, Deanna Marie Alcianak, John Mark Hendrick, Robert Harmon Sword, Tyrell Fincher, an unidentified person, William Patrick Floyd, Thomas Owens, Shane Farewell, Jacob Emery McKelvin, Etan Tanzamore, Jesse Stringfield, Anthony Eduardo Pacheco, Valente Acosta Bustillos, Shane Tillman Kent, John H. Ross, an unidentified person, Austin Hines, Nathan R. Hodge, David A. Zenantos, Jose Marino, Joseph Zahakzuski, Jose Soto, Leonard Bliss, an unidentified person, Carl Manning, Michael Leon Hammett, Philip Castanguay, Richard Lee Campstra, Kelvin Parks, Yamil Acevedo, 
Brandon, Mark, Stokes, Idris, Abdus Salam, Joshua Bako, Jacob Matthew Dahl, Derek T. Swanson, Dwayne Curtis LaFond, Rick Howe, Joshua Darinandre Rufin, Zion Romier Witch, Kenneth Jeremy Blair, Zachary Shane Gifford, Matt Goff, Giuseppe Patricia None, Sean Lee, Jonathan Lee Adams, Leah Baker, Errol Bolin, Timothy Barker, Justin Silvernail, Miguel Gomez, an unidentified person, Javier Vidal, Thomas A. Powell, Tony Clements, Leslie Flynn, Randy Ashland, Goldie Bellinger, and that brings us to April 16th. You can write to Sean Swain at his latest address at Sean Swain number 2015638, Buckingham Correctional, P.O. Box 430, Dillwyn, Virginia 23936. You can find his past writings, recordings of his audio segments, and updates on his case at seanswain.org, or now follow him on Twitter at, at Swain Rocks. This is The Final Straw, and I'm Bursa Goodness. The show will later be archived at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org, and you can email us with questions and suggestions at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net or thefinalstrawradio at protonmail.com. If you'd like to use any episode for your project or radio show, feel free to do so. Just send us an email to let us know. If you care to, you can send us letters at The Final Straw Radio, P.O. Box 6004, Asheville, North Carolina, 28816. This show is brought to you by Firestorm Books and Coffee. Located at 610 Haywood Road, Firestorm Books and Coffee is a worker-owned co-op in Asheville specializing in offbeat, underground, and independent literature. You can find a catalog of Firestorm's books and zines, plus a full calendar of events up at their website, firestorm.coop.